So there's a crooked definition with regards to the word white supremacy. and It's kind of a really hot buzzword that the neoliberal elite love to say and everybody else. So I thought I would um, explain what exactly is quote unquote white supremacy through this oral presentation. So the other day ago on uh, the inauguration, our dear leader and supreme leader, uh, Joe Biden, talked about um, dismantling white supremacy as being the uh, tide that's destroying America, that um, it's okay to disagree with him. You know, he's, he's bringing up these bizarre Sargon of Akkad, centrist liberal thinking. We can have a society so as long as it's uh, quote unquote peaceful. I can go on and argue how much this is capitalist control of our minds, but um, I want to get to his word about white supremacy and what that means to the elite and what that means to a a person to everyday thinking. So if you go and Google search the definition of white supremacy, you'll find this definition, the belief that white people constitute a superior race and should therefore dominate society, typically to the exclusion of other racial and ethnic groups, in particular black or Jewish people. So you see, you can dismantle white supremacy so as long as you allow quote-unquote black and Jewish people into the mixture, which is very suspicious why you would allow Jewish people to control everything legitimizing Kevin McDonald or even E. Michael Jones when they criticize Jews or even blacks in general. So there's kind of this cottage house market for these types of whiteness study books. For example, how the Irish became white, white Christian privilege, how Jews became white folks. So note that the word white is not some kind of family tree of admixture European people but rather it's, it's, it's a class label. And so they're using it in academic semantics to talk about an attitude, an ideology, a way of thinking. And once you understand that axiom, it becomes this kind of whole school of studies known predominantly as whiteness studies. And this is the study of the structures that produce white privilege. And that whiteness, not white, I guess white is whiteness, is when analyzed as a race, a culture, and a source of systematic racism. Another buzzword that they like to say. And it just, it's, it's, it's a social surprising phenomenon. It's, it's, it's something that um, it's perception grouped of behaviors of white people. And again, they're not saying French, German, Irish, Spanish people. They're saying white people. And... Um, they, they, they use the word social construction, as in white people is not an organic, Heideggerian, authentic identity. It, it's some kind of egalitarian social construction among an admixture of European people. This picture right here is the quintessential white family of 1950s America. A white Aryan man with his Aryan children of a perfect eugenic stock buying a car and going out for picnic and having quality family time together and having a good wage job that makes $80 an hour and having a house in no name Cheyenne, Wyoming and doing this in the the thousand year kingdom of the third Reich. And supposedly according to whiteness study, this is, this is evil. Um, This is not a group of people. Rather, this is an ideological set. This is not a French, German, Irish group of people with their own language. It's some kind of modernized group that, like the Irish becoming white, uh, form under this culture under capitalism. And so they're no longer an authentic identity. They're what you would call whiteness. Uh, Two books explain this further. I would recommend Class by Paul Fussell and Coming Apart by Charles Murray. Class by Fussell argues that everything, especially under the admixture Europeans of white America, they are basically 
they're, they're, they're defined, class is defined through ideology and through the interest of culture. And where you are in class determines that. You know, if you have a dumb job working the night shift, putting boxes in a truck, you're going to like crass music and watch the TV. But if you have a white collar job and you're an artist, you are going to live in New York City or L.A. And you are higher on the bell curve. Pretty much that. And that's what divides other admixture European people. In Coming Apart, Charles Murray has more of a pessimist outlook. Uh, using the examples of poor white America and rich white America, how they're just deteriorating and it really doesn't matter about class because whiteness is not a real identity and admixture European people who they really can't have a race together. And so this is why we're seeing this incredible self-loathing among each other. I want to further explain that this kind of interest in whiteness also has a parody in kind of the avant-garde art scene. In particular, the work of John Kay, uh, creator of Ren and Stimpy and George Licker, he basically is obsessed with this 1950s white America where everybody's a wife beater, um, everybody is interested in 1950s culture, and this kind of a thousand year kingdom will reign supreme forever, ever. And this is what it means to be white. But he does this in kind of an acid, kind of psychedelic, traumatic, Hatesville type of way in his art. Speaking of Hatesville, Jim Goad, who was a part of Boyd Rice's posse, recently wrote a book called Whiteness, The Original Sin. Goad is a transgressive writer and artist, praised by Chuck Palahniuk and Margaret Cho, um, oh, and Chris Corda. He writes a book explaining why being white isn't so bad at all. I mean, for the author of The Redneck Manifesto and being poor, white, and retarded, that becomes kind of its own punk rock skinhead scene. But he's making the same arguments that John Kay is doing in Rand Stimpy, just in a more avant-garde, in-your-face type of way. So as you can see, these kind of art literature is a reaction against this whiteness studies. And I think this is the agitation form of it. So I really want to get across is that there's two defining definitions of, what, of white supremacy, or what the word white means. So the first definition is kind of this common sense definition, which I call it the right-wing nationalist definition, that white, as I was saying before, is an admixture European people with a racial consciousness. And that's how we're supposedly supposed to be defined together. It doesn't matter if you're French, Irish, half French, half Irish, somehow we're all going to work it out and um, be American civic nationalists or have this kind of white whites only cabal which again if you use the second definition which is everyone else under the neoliberal world order white means eurocentric suburban middle class values destroying the arts culture intellectualism and the rhizomic platonic society that other white cosmopolitan elites may have and so if you use the second def definition it kind of rejects and rebukes the first definition that when you hear the word anti-white, they're not anti-white as in that they hate admixture European people with racial consciousness. They're anti-white because they're anti-suburban middle class values or this picture of this white family. That people who are the most anti-white just want to live in New York City or L.A. and do the arts. They're on the higher bell curve and they don't want to continue this boring, crass society. In fact, the most greatest anti-white people are French nationalists, are German nationalists. They don't want to be white. And that's why there'll be a death to America very shortly. So this also brings up more with semantics, I just wanted to say. You might hear the word queer. So, for example, in this book, Good White Queers, Racism and Whiteness in Queer U.S. Comics. So... Again, you have to be on your academic semantics uh, game to understand what's going on. So you have to think that queers, which is also another subcultural thing, can be white. Can you be queer and be white, or is queer anti-white? Uh, a friend of mine wrote a book called Queer Culture, A Transgressive Tradition, which explains the semantic basis of queer culture in the art world. And I strongly, strongly recommend reading 
a queer culture, a transgressive tradition before you read good queer white, uh, good queer whites or good, good white queers. And, um, again, there's a whole thing of queerness studies. The, the concept that you're Eurocentric, rhizomic, platonic, uh, black and gay, um, a Mexican goth girl that takes bottle caps and gamer culture, anything's plausible. And that makes you queer outside of that Ren and Stimpy uh, suburban society. And this, this while understanding whiteness as a social construct and queer, we understand what Joe Biden is talking about. Joe Biden wants a society without white supremacy, and we need more queer liberation. That is the answer. So what is the future without whiteness? Well, I, I think there's multifolds of it, a lot of things that can happen. I think a future without whiteness means living the life like the Royal Tenenbaums or any film by Wes Anderson. Now, this is ironic. They are a white family, the Royal Ten Bonds. But notice they're in the upper class. Notice they don't live in suburban America. Notice that they're proud of their dysfunctionality. They're not, quote-unquote, white. They're not living in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. They're not living in suburban America. They are living a ritzy life of art artists' eccentric interest at the top. And they're no longer white. They're not this mold. They're queer and eccentric. You also have Blobby and Friends, the middle comic, about this brown, Lantix, Asianic, Eurasian anime realist girl that hangs with her Blobby fish and continuing upholding neoliberal white people values of capitalist interest. Now, this is kind of ironic because wouldn't whiteness mean middle-class values? And isn't SJWism middle-class value? A absolutely. And so this is why I bring this up. There's this kind of ironic loophole, this hypocrisy on the Royal Tannenbaums and Blobby and Friends and the CalArts movement in general, that it is middle-class values of self-loathingness and that white supremacy just means no more suburban culture. And we're left with a artsy... Asian Aryanism, as I jokingly call it, uh, this kind of Eurasian futurism where anime is real, nobody's Chad, nobody's Stacy, we don't have to listen to Insane Clown Posse anymore, we can li listen to Atari Teenage Riot for the rest of our lives and anime will become real uh, and solve our problems and our little uh, Eurocentric capitalist bubble that isn't Eurocentric at all because, and this is the point I want to get across. So there are European admixture people. They just don't want to be white anymore. They want to be liberal, democratic, universal, egalitarian individuals that don't see themselves as white. They see themselves as a platonic, rhizomic elites that, if chance, wants to be an Asian girl or something like that. And this is why Asian Aryanism is so important. So I strongly believe that a French nationalist should go against white supremacy. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe and smash that like button.